chapter seven is covering the nurse client relationships. Please take a moment and stop this presentation in order to review the learning objectives. We'll start by describing um, the scope of the nurse client relationship, but before that, let's define the word relationship. Relationship represents an association between two or more people, and this needs to develop over time. Um, when we apply that for the nursing field, um, a nurse will develop a professional, caring, and healing relationship with both clients and families, as well as depending on the scope of practice for um, that nurse with community groups uh, without having any type of prejudice for their lifestyles, value systems, or religious beliefs. Um, in other words, the nurse will respect the client as a person and um, will detail all those elements in, in, in this presentation. So when we define the, the relationship as a professional relationship, um, it means that the nurse, while developing this relationship, it will bring in her knowledge, um, her or his knowledge, and um, her or his unique clinical skills that, and I quote, protect, promote, and optimize health and abilities, prevent illness and injuries, alleviate suffering, and advocate in the care of individuals, families, communities, and population. So in other words, the nurse-client relationship um, will exist during the period when the nurse will interact with the client. Either the client is sick or well, um, or when the nurse needs to promote or restore their health. Um, in other um, situations, the nurse will help them to cope with their illness um, and even assist them to die with dignity. So the nursing roles uh, within the client relationship are very uh, complex and we'll develop them, we'll discuss them in, in, the following, um, in the following part of this lecture. So let's, let's define, let's describe a little bit about, let's talk about the nursing roles. Um, so a nurse-client relationship will require from the nurse size to be able and willing to respond to the client's needs. Uh, the National Council of State Board of Nursing, which develops the National Council Licensure Examination of Practical Nurses, or what you know as NCLEX-PN, um, identified four categories of client needs. And those categories include safe and effective care environment, health promotion and maintenance, psychosocial integrity, and physiologic integrity. So in order to meet those needs, the nurse will perform four basic roles. They will be either, or sometimes in the same time, caregiver, educator, collaborator, and also delegate. Let's develop this a little bit more. So let's look at those four basic roles. So we'll start with the role of caregiver, it is the one that performs the health-related activities that a sick person is not able to perform independently. So in terms of responsibilities, well, the nurse possess, will have the actual knowledge for performing that, uh, will be aware of some unique age-related differences, will be able and trained to perform technical skills in a safe manner, will be committed to the client care, will be available and purchased, uh, will allow clients to participate in their decisions, always will stay non-judgmental, will advocate on the client's behalf whenever that is needed, and will be able to provide all the explanation in a language, in a jargon that is easily to understand for the patient. While all those are done in order to promote the client um, independence. So traditionally, when we are looking at the nurses, they were, they were the physical care providers. Um, and that's not enough. Um, this traditional definition was not including the caring that will involve a close emotional relationship. And in a modern nursing, we do understand that illnesses and injuries are connected and will have uh, a lot of feelings of insecurity. Um, and those may impair the patient's ability to cope with a new situation. So this being said, the nurse is the client's guide, will be the interpreter, the companion, and will allow them to um, understand better the process that they are, need to go through. So they will, the nurse needs to use what is called the empathy, that intuitive awareness 
um, that allows the nurse to understand what the client is experiencing. Um, that will allow the nurse to perceive the client's emotional state and their needs for support. So in other words, the empathy will help the nurse to become effective in providing for the client's needs while also remaining compassionately detached. Let's look now into the role of educator. So an educator is that person that provo provides information. A nurse is able to offer health teaching that will be applied to the client's needs and also to their level of knowledge. So let's look into a few examples of those. Um, a nurse may need to uh, provide explanations about diagnostic test procedures or how to self-administer medication, um, sometimes uh, on techniques for managing wound care or how to perform restorative exercises as, um, let's say, those that are needed by a patient after a mastectomy. Let's look into a different situation now. The patient was um, told by the provider um, that there was a treatment decision. Let's say there is a surgical procedure that is recommended by the provider. In this situation, the nurse needs to avoid giving advice. And this is because the, each person needs to make his or her own decision on every type of matter that will affect their personal health and Ill illness. What, what a nurse can do is to share all the pertinent information on all potential alternatives and will allow the client the freedom to choose while supporting the client's ultimate decision. So we say that nursing is a practice without walls. It means that it will extend beyond the original treatment facility. It will carry on with your patients after they will leave the facility. So the nurse represents that resource for information about healthcare services available in the community. And by offering that, the nurse is able to empower the clients becoming more involved with self-help groups or uh, with some rehab uh, facilities. Uh, they will have a better understanding and knowledge about financial assistance, and not the least, to have the necessary emotional support. We continue with the four basic roles and we are looking now at the role of collaborator. So the collaborator is that person that will work with others in order to achieve a common goal. It's obviously that in the treatment of a client, there are several people, a lot of them that are involved from different points of view in the same treatment and working toward the common goal to make that person healthy or functional again. Um, in terms of um, collaboration, that will take place um, in, in many setups will be when the nurse and the physician will share information or uh, when the nurse is sharing information with a dietitian, uh, with a physical therapist, with a respiratory therapist, and why not with a discharge planner. The delegator role. A delegator will be a person that is able uh, to assign a task to someone else. So before even looking into the role of delegator, um, we need to look and define the five basic aspects of delegation. Before I'm delegating, I must understand what task is appropriate to be delegated to a particular healthcare provider. If I consider that it's unsafe to delegate a task to someone who does not have the knowledge or the expertise to perform it correctly, I will not do it. Now, I decide that I have the right task for the right person. Now, once a task has been assigned, it is still my responsibility as a delegator to check that the task has been performed and also to determine the resulting outcome. And I'll give you an example. Let's say that I delegate a nursing assistant to change a client's position. I must verify both that the assistant has completed the job and also I will ask about the condition of the client's skin. If the delegated task was not performed or the performance was incorrectly done, I am accountable for any type of inadequate client care. So the fact that you're delegating a certain task to someone else doesn't take the responsibility out of you. You are still very much responsible for everything that happens.
What is the primary function of the nurse in the role of educator? Giving advice, assigning tasks, providing information, or working with others? As educators, nurses are resources of information and empower clients to become involved. An educator is one who provides information and nurses offer health teaching that is pertinent to each client's needs and knowledge base. Let's discuss now the phases of the nurse-client relationship. And by now, you probably um, have an idea that this relationship is um, a mix and match of a lot of interactions over a certain period of time. And definitely the primary focus of, of this interaction will be to help the patient, the client, to achieve self-care and independence. And the nurse is doing that by transferring the patient with her knowledge and her skills um, that were achieved based on any type of evidence-based nursing practices. So any type of relationship um, um, between a nurse and the client will go through several phases. We have um, actually, um, we have a, a pre-interaction, we have an introductory phase, a working phase and a terminating phase. The pre-interaction phase, it's um, not always presented as part of the phases, but it's very, very essential. And you will see it in a moment because that starts even before um, me as a nurse will have the first contact with the client. Um, in this pre-interaction phase, I will try to uh, prepare myself for this interaction. I will try to gather all those preliminary information that will make me knowledgeable even before seeing my first hello. Um, and I will try and find out at least the initial diagnosis, the age of the client. If there are any previous medical records, there are very uh, valuable sources of additional information. And I will try and gather my information also from other healthcare providers that can be nurses or uh, uh, physician assistants or um, health, other healthcare providers that were already interacting with that patient before me. Once I have at least a few elements, and let's say an admitting diagnosis or some um, um, first complaints for that patient, I start to formulate in my head an expectation for various problems that they, the client may experience, um, and I will um, apply that once I'm um, interacting with the patient. So we are moving now into the first actual phase of the interaction um, that is called the introductory phase. And this starts at the moment that I meet my client and I get acquainted with the client and um, my client will express one or more health problems uh, for which he or she will look for care. It's definitely, um, we are looking now to a relationship that will be established between two individuals that have preconceived ideas about each other and those assumptions will be either confirmed or dismissed. So it's always good to start the first contact by exchanging names and the handshake if possible. Um, before calling a person by their first name, always obtain permission um, and wait to be invited to use a more familiar form of address. Otherwise, uh, be very polite. Um, some culture uh, reserve those familiar form of address uh, for family and very close friends. So we don't want to, um, to step any boundaries. We need to address um, our clients with courtesy. We need to exhibit active listening, empathy, competence, and all the appropriate communication skills um, that may show you, they may show your client that you value them. Also, you need to demonstrate the partnership and advocacy in the client healthcare. Um, and we do that by um, treating its client as a unique person and respecting their feelings. Um, we need to let them understand that we are here to promote their physical, emotional, social, and spiritual well-being. We need to encourage them to participate in the problem-solving and decision-making. They cannot be a passive spectator um, of the process. We need to communicate in terms and language that the client will understand based on their level. And um, we need to use a nursing process that is very individualized for this client's care. Whenever it's possible, um, we will involve the support system for the client. That can be family and friends. Um, definitely, this will be done only if the client is giving their consent. We are moving now into the 
next stage. And next stage will be a working phase. In the working phase, we have a mutually planning of the client's care, and we also put that plan in action. For doing that, both parts of those relationships, both the nurse and the client, need to participate. And each side uh, will share in performing those tasks in order to reach the desired outcome. And this desired outcome needs to be identified both by the nurse and the client. Well, I will give you some examples. During this phase, by um, attending and acknowledging the client's personal dietary preferences, will demonstrate the patient that we do see them as a unique individual. We'll need to support the client's independence by allowing the client to face his or her own care, even when this requires more time. When we are pushing our clients and we are trying to do too much for them, in a very little time, that can be harmful. Therefore, allowing independence in self-care and decision-making will promote both dignity and self-esteem. Once the working phase is done, we are getting into the terminating phase. And this phase is the one when both sides of the relationship, both the nurse and the client, will mutually agree that the client's immediate health problems have improved and the nurse's services are no longer necessary. Regression evidenced by an increased reliance on nursing assistance or the reemergence of physical symptoms may point out an underlying fearing of having to assume some independent responsibility for self-care on the patient's side. Well, in this case, the nurse must ensure that the client is not developing healthcare related complications first. Once we know that their health is as we um, want it to be, there with a compassionate and care attitude, we will help facilitate the client transition to independent living or whenever there is a need for that transfer to other healthcare services. We'll start discussing now the communication. And per definition, communication represents an exchange of information. Um, by saying that, uh, we understand that will involve both sending and receiving messages between at least two individuals. Um, in most cases, will be more than, than two. As a result of this exchange, there will be some feedback that will indicate that the information is understood or if the information will need further clarification. Uh, in your um, NCLEX, you will have questions and examples that will relate to the use of therapeutic communication, and they will test your understanding of uh, normal um, or uh, efficient uh, nursing communication. Uh, the Joint Commission is um, establishing the standards that are promoting the high quality, safe and effective care, um, and they are very specific and when, when they are defining their standards of goal and goals in terms of communication. Uh, they are looking into um, a nurse that will demonstrate uh, leadership and commitment to, to effective communication. They will look in um, and establish if the facilities will have the culture competence. They will also look and see if there is a client or family center type of care. They will um, examine if there is any type of um, effectiveness of communication among caregivers and how the facility is promoting that, as well as um, if the facility uh, has a policy that encourage clients active involvement in their own care as a, a client safety strategy. We'll describe now different types of um, communication and we'll start with the verbal one. Um, the verbal communication obviously will use words. It will include speaking, reading, and writing. Um, and there are a few elements that may affect the verbal communication, um, especially between the client and the nurse, as well as um, between the different healthcare providers. And some of those um, factors that may influence the communication are related to attention and concentration, language compatibility, verbal skills, hearing and visual acuity, motor functions involving the throat, tongue, and teeth, noise and distracting activities, interpersonal attitudes, literacy, 
cultural similarities and listening. So among all those elements that they seem very important, every single one uh, can interfere and prevent a, an efficient communication. Um, we'll discuss a little bit about uh, more in depth about listening. Um, listening is just as important during communication as speaking. Now let's compare and contrast listening and hearing. Hearing represents just perceiving sound, while listening is that activity that will include um, attention, attending to, becoming involved in what's being said. So an empathetic listening implies that the nurse will attempt to perceive the client's emotions and meaning. And whenever the nurse is able to show empathy to clients, uh, it will help them to feel both understood and valued. Most of the time, the empathetic listening is demonstrating through nonverbal means. Um, with most American clients, whenever we are uh, communicating with them, it is a best, the best idea is to position uh, ourselves at the client's level, um, keeping a frequent eye contact. Um, there are some small differences um, in cultural expectations, however. Nodding and encouraging the client to continue with comments such as, yes, I see. Convey interest in what the client is saying and the nurse guards against any messages that may uh, include boredom, such as looking out the window or interrupting the, the client while they are commenting. So if we have a verbal communication, definitely we have a nonverbal one. And that represents the exchange of information without usage of words. It's, it's pretty much what is not said. And we'll have components such as kinetics, paralanguage, proxemics, touch and silence. Uh, and we'll discuss a little bit about each of them. Uh, when we talk about kinetics, that refers to the body language. Um, that is a collective nonverbal technique that will include both facial expressions and posture, gestures and body movements, uh, sometimes even clothing style and accessories uh, can affect the context of communication. So the knowledge of kinesics is very important uh, for the nurse when it's being um, evaluated by his or her clients and, and definitely vice versa is, is true also. So how can we create a positive impression during a nurse-client interaction? So first of all, stay, stay straight, stand tall, do not, um, do not uh, crouch yourself. Relax arms, legs and feet, and do not cross any body part, especially do not cross your arms across your chest. Maintain eye contact most of the time, at least 70% of the time. Again, there might be some cultures where that is inappropriate. Whenever you are present in a group, focus on the last person who spoke. Your head should be kept level both horizontally and vertically. Lean a little bit forward to demonstrate interest and attention. Keep your arms where they can be seen. Strike a balance in arm movements, being neither too demonstrative or, nor too restrained. And keep your legs, especially your legs, um, as still as possible. Now let's look into the paralanguage. Paralanguage refers to vocal sounds, not actual words that may communicate a message. I give you an example. I just did that. I was drawing a deep breath to indicate surprise or clucking the tongue to show disappointment and whistling to get someone's attention. All those are paralanguages. Crying, laughing, and moaning are additional forms uh, and some vocal inflections, the volume, pitch, and rate of speech add yet another dimension to communication. Proxemics. Proxemics refer to the use of space when communicating. In general, there are four proxemic zones um, common um, when communicate with American clients. Those zones will include intimate space, personal space, social space, and public space. Now, intimate space is, is in within six inches. Um, this is used um, in a very intimate relationship with some um, close uh, uh, people in our lives, uh, whenever we are confining secrets or sharing confidential information. We have what is called a personal space, six inches to four feet. Uh, and this is used when interviewing, when performing a physical assessment, um, in most of the therapeutic interventions that may involve touching and also in private conversations. The third type of space 
which is the social space. It's between four and 12 feet, and will include, um, as an example of that, we use that when in group interactions in lecturing or um, in teaching 101. We have the public space, which is 12 feet or more, um, that it's defined uh, as a situation when we are giving speeches or when there are big gatherings uh, with, that will include a lot of strangers. Most Americans feel comfortable with strangers that are two to three feet away, um, which is usually um, the relationship that a nurse client will have. Uh, determining the circumference of a person's comfort zone, that area that when intruded upon does not create anxiety is very important because physical closeness is um, needed and common during nursing care. However, that may increase a client's, client's anxiety uh, by being too close. That's why it's good to, before doing it, before becoming too close to a patient, we need to explain um, to explain to them the need for a certain type of nursing procedure and what will be performed while ensuring uh, that their privacy will be respected. We are moving forward with a nonverbal communication and we are talking now about uh, the touch. Um, touch represents that tactile stimulus that will be produced by personal contact with either another person or an object. In the context of nursing, uh, definitely the touch will be task-oriented, effective, or uh, in most cases, which is uh, desirable, need to be both. The task-oriented touch involves the personal contact that is required when performing a nursing procedure. Effective, A, starts with an A, A, F, F, effective touch can be used to demonstrate concern or affection. The intention for the effective touch is to communicate caring and support. And uh, most people will respond positively to being touched. However, um, the nurse should not use the effective touch um, in all situations. Um, that needs to be used cautiously. There is a great, because there is a, is a great variation in responses among individuals, not everyone uh, will be happy to, uh, to be touched in an effective way. We can use it, this effect, effective touch, um, therapeutically uh, for a client when the client is lonely, uncomfortable, um, in near-death situations, in um, patients that are feeling uh, anxiety, they're insecure or frightened, disoriented, uh, semi-conscious or comatose, uh, in those visually impaired, or that they have some type of visual deprivation. There are some gerontologic considerations, and there is not enough evidence to support the use of touch with an older adult. However, um, the touch should be used purposefully to reinforce verbal message or in a manner that is culturally appropriate um, to show concern or support. Older adults may perceive touch as culturally inappropriate, offensive, or threatening. Uh, they are frail and vulnerable. Um, and because of that, they may have a, an impaired perception of touch. That's why a nurse needs to use a lot of judgment uh, whenever they are in, in this type of situation and they need to obtain permission before touching um, any um, older adult. Another type of, um, and the last one, the last type of nonverbal communication will be the silence. Um, and it's interesting, think about it. Um, the silence represent um, the state of remaining quiet, um, not saying anything, not making any type of noise. Um, in most of the cases, it has a therapeutic use because it will encourage the client's verbal communication, will encourage the, the other side to speak. Um, in, in other cases, it will include providing a personal presence and the, and the brief period during which the client can process information um, and respond to a question or just um, not being alone. Another type of communication is the therapeutic communication, which um, can be verbal or nonverbal uh, or both of them. And it's used in order to promote the person's physical and emotional well-being. Um, let's discuss a few um, examples of that. One technique for therapeutic communication will be to have what is called the broad opening position. Uh, that will relieve tension before getting to, to the real purpose of the interaction. Um, and as an example for that, we can use a statement as, 
oh, what a wonderful weather we are having. Another type of te technique will be um, giving information, providing, providing facts, um, is just um, letting the patient know when their procedures are scheduled. We may use direct questioning um, that is used whenever we need to acquire specific information, asking the patients, let's say, uh, what is the medication that are you uh, currently taking? We may use open-ended questions that will encourage the client to elaborate um, in terms of how are you feeling? We can use um, a technique of reflecting and that will help the client understand that you are following the conversation. Uh, let's say the client says, uh, I haven't been sleeping well. Um, you will return the sentence by saying, oh, so you haven't been sleeping well. That let them know that you are registering what they are saying. We can use paraphrasing techniques that will be restating what the client has said to demonstrate that we are listening. Um, and this is an example. After every will, if the client will say that after um, each meal, uh, they feel like uh, will throw up, um, the nurse can paraphrase that by saying, so eating makes you nauseous, but you don't know actually vomit. That's not only paraphrasing it, but it's also um, kind of asking the patient to elaborate if it feels, if, if they think that you didn't understand um, the elements um, accurately. Uh, we can use uh, clarifying techniques to avoid misinterpretation. Um, we can uh, address it with a statement as, I'm afraid I don't quite understand what you're asking. Uh, we may do, another technique will be confronting. Um, and this is used whenever um, there is uh, an attention to manipulation, inconsistencies, or lack of responsibility. Uh, and a good statement for that will be, so, you're telling me that you're concerned about your weight loss, but you didn't eat any breakfast. We can use techniques of summarizing um, that will be um, reviewing information that has been um, discussed as, um, you've asked me to check on increasing your pain medication and getting your diet changed. Along with all those therapeutic communications, we have what is called the non-therapeutic communication technique that we are trying to avoid as much as possible. Um, one of them will be the, to give false reassurance. And um, that will um, make the client feel that they're not unique and will discourage any type of sharing information in the future. An example of that will be, oh, you've got nothing to worry about. It Everything will work out just fine. Instead of saying that, we should address a patient by saying, okay, so tell me, tell me about your specific concern. We should avoid using cliches. Um, that will provide worthless advice and, and will, you, you will stop the patient by, to explore any other alternatives. Uh, an example of that um, will be, a, a non-therapeutic communication example will be, keep a stiff upper lip. Uh, instead of that, we should address it as, it must be difficult for you right now. Another type of non-therapeutic communication is giving approval or disapproval. Oh, I'm so glad you're exercising so regularly. Instead of saying that, we should use a statement as, are you having any difficulty fitting regular exercise into your schedule? Trying to find out more information about how the patient is adjusting to that new type of, of activity, instead of just confirming that they are doing it and kind of dismissing it. We should avoid agreeing because it will not allow the client the flexibility to change his or her mind. Um, an example of a non-therapeutic type of statement will be, oh, you're right about needing surgery immediately. Instead of saying that, we can say, well, having surgery immediately is one possibility. Have you considered any others? Along with agreeing, we should avoid uh, definitely disagreeing. Uh, and an example will be, oh, that's not true. Where did you get an idea like that? Instead of that, we can ask the patient, may I can help clarify that for you? Giving advice. I started the lecture by saying that we should not give advice because that will discourage the independent problem solving on the side of the client and 
their decision making will be prevented. Um, and it provides a biased view that may prejudice the client's choice. We should avoid saying something like, if I were you, I'd try drug therapy before having any surgery. Instead of that, um, we can say, well, if you would like to share with me the advantages and disadvantages of your options, um, as you see them, I can, I can um, help you sort through them. We should avoid patronizing that will treat the client condescendingly as not being capable of making any type of independent decision. And an example of that will be, are we ready for a bath yet? Instead of that, we should offer an option, a statement like, would you like your bath now or should I check with you later? And even better would be to give them a certain time frame. Also, we should avoid changing the subject that will alter the direction of discussion to a topic that is safer or more comfortable most of the time for the, the nurse and not as much for the client. So let's say the client is having a is making a statement about being scared to have um, a mammogram because that may uh, find out cancer. Um, and the nurse's uh, answer will be, oh, tell me more about your family. Instead of that, a normal response, a good therapeutic response will be, well, cancer is a serious disease. Can you tell me what concerns you have the most? The nurse tells the client, why won't you use your walker? Are you wanting to fall and break your head? This is an example of which of the following barriers to communication. A, using comments that give advice. B, using belittling language. C, using leading questions. Or D, using probing questions. This is an example of using belittling language. Using belittling and judgmental comments tends to impose the nurse's standards on the client. In this case, the nurse judges the patient as being lazy and the nurse's apparent hostility could end effective communication. Let's discuss now about communicating with special uh, types of clients, special populations. The Joint Commission is uh, mandating the healthcare providers to facilitate communication with all the clients. And they do that by requiring the agencies to have a system that allows uh, for auxiliary aids to be provided as well as services that will be able to address the communication needs of the clients that have hearing, visual, or speech impairment, as well as literacy needs. In addition to that, uh, the facilities will need to provide language interpreting and translation services for those clients who do not speak English or have only limited uh, English proficiency. And we'll start discussing the communication with verbally impaired clients. And uh, in most cases, uh, those patients um, are not able to communicate verbally despite the fact that they are proficient in English. Uh, I will give you a few examples of cases. They may be patients that have a complication of a stroke that is called expressive aphasia. They um, have an inability to utilize verbal language skills. There may be those clients that have artificial airways such as an endotracheal tube placed in, or they have a tracheostomy tube, they may have their jaws uh, wired together following um, surgery of um, the face or the jaws. In addition to that, some of the clients that may have um, inability to communicate verbally may uh, be those that had traumatic brain injuries, um, cerebral palsy patients, uh, or those that have a multiple sclerosis. So, Again, Joint Commission is mandating us um, to be able to communicate efficiently with our, pa with our patients. So um, the first and most simple thing that a nurse can provide an impaired client is to have a tablet, uh, a magic slate, um, a pencil and a notebook. Um, however, this approach is kind of time consuming. And in a lot of cases, those clients that have a speech impairment uh, have also an inability to use their hands in an efficient way and they have fine motor skills impairment. So it may prevent them from being efficient in using this type of writing devices. Um, in other cases, uh, to improve the communication, we may have um, um, uh, tablets that will have on them uh, common phrases that the client can point to, uh, or may, they may 
spell with an alphabet, or they may have um, numbers that they can identify on a communication board. For those that have uh, tracheostomy, or those that had a, laryn uh, a laryngectomy, that is the removal of the voice box, um, the nurse can um, use an electrolarynx, that is a handheld device that can be placed in front of the neck and uh, the surface will vibrate and me mechanically will resonate just like the voice box is doing when words or sound are produced. Other types of uh, technology can be uh, electronic uh, devices that are touched to speak or um, uh, touch talk uh, as alternative communication devices. Communicating with a deaf client. Um, a deaf individual is defined as unable to hear well enough to use hearing as a mean of processing information. Um, a hard of hearing is someone that has some level of hearing. However, 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 I'm sorry, it is unable to use this efficiently for communication uh, purposes. Well, if we have a deaf client that is able to read and write, uh, we can do that. Uh, in order to facilitate communication. Um, that cannot be useful for all the clients, however, and it may be uh, very slow. For those deaf clients, especially those that were born deaf uh, or lost their hearing at a very early age, uh, we can use the American Sign Language, ASL, um, that by using hand movements and finger spelling, um, we may communicate with them. Um, not everyone in a healthcare agency may be proficient in ASL, and sometimes in some of the facilities, there is no one actually knowing ASL. And in order to overcome this barrier, some hospitals have um, a, a video system where there is a video interpreter uh, that is proficient in ASL that can help um, to uh, communicate and provide information uh, to you in order to communicate with your patient. Um, there is another way of communicating. Um, they may, um, the hospitals may also make a text telephone, a TTY or a telecommunication device for the deaf, uh, a TTD that um, is um, available for speech impaired, deaf or hard of um, hearing patients uh, where they can type the messages rather than talking and listening. We'll describe now how do we communicate with limited English proficiency clients. So once um, the client is reporting that they do not speak English well or they do not speak English, English at all, they will fall into the category of limited English proficiency, LEP. Um, for in, in this case, um, their level of understanding English is so low that we're not going to permit an effective interaction with them. Um, regardless at what level of interaction during the healthcare uh, uh, providing. If we are looking um, in the, at the statistics, especially from the Center for Immigration Studies, um, there are about a little bit over um, 61 million of people, about one in five, that speak a language other than English at home. And out of those, about 41% they speak English less than very well. So the proportion of people who speak a particular language other than English will also vary geographically. For example, Spanish is very common. Um, it's, speaking, it's very common in Southwest. Um, however, it's very uh, seldom found in Northeast sections of the United States. So regardless of all those statistics, we do need to have an interpreter that will allow us to communicate with those, um, with those people. So we have what is called a certified interpreter, which is the uh, best form of communication uh, with um, um, the, um, an LEP client. So those certified interpreters will be paid uh, and provided by the uh, healthcare agency to convert spoken or sign language between a healthcare provider and the non-English speaking client into English. Um, they can be available on site or available by a web uh, camera. So once the individual will meet the age and education requirements, the candidates um, can become nationally certified by satisfactorily passing a written and oral uh, examination. Uh, the recertification of those interpreters is done every five years uh, by 
completing continuing education requirements or by retaking the medical certification um, examination. Now, it's the full responsibility of a healthcare agency to obtain those qualified interpreters. And the goal is to engage the services of individuals who are competent in the client's language and also um, are uh, impartial, accurate, and maintain confidentiality, as well as they have a good knowledge and understanding of medical terminology. We may have what is called an ad hoc interpreter that um, we can use whenever a certified interpreter is not available. Um, and in descending orders, uh, for preference, we will look into an untrained agency employee, uh, which is usually a bilingual staff member, a self-declared bilingual volunteer, um, and also families or friends, um, which are the last uh, preferred um, option. In terms of telephonic interpreting, in the absence of a, of a certified or ad hoc interpreter, we can um, use a telephonic interpreting, which is over the phone translation as an alternative. Um, and AT&T USA Direct In-Language Services uh, provides translators in 140 languages uh, whenever that is uh, needed. We also have um, another option it's called the communication board and um, is the most primitive one uh, that will show illustration and translated words and phrases um, in order to be able to immediate assist bedside and interact with the clients uh, be and assess, I mean, pr um, perform the um, communication between the clients and the uh, nursing staff. Client speaking. A very important part of the nurse activity is um, includes the sharing of information and educating um, the patient. By doing that, we promote the client's ability to understand um, the current healthcare environment and independently be able to uh, meet his or her future uh, health needs. Both the client and the nurse needs to understand very well since the beginning that the hospitalization time is limited. So the nurse needs to start education, educating clients as soon as possible, uh, immediately after admission. The teaching will continue while the nurse will care for the clients either in their home or when they are referred to uh, other uh, facilities, uh, other setups of uh, medical care. Before we are starting to educate the client, we need to assess um, our learner. And by doing that, we determine various components of the client's learning stats. Before the ter besides determining the style of learning of the client, uh, the nurse also needs to understand and assess the client's learning style, um, age and developmental level, learning needs, learning capacity, motivation for learning, and learning readiness. Now, let's look at the learning styles. The learning style represents the manner in which a person best comprehends new information, and usually people will fall into one of the three categories. They will be either cognitive, affective, or psychomotor learners. Now, the cognitive learner will process information best by listening or reading facts and description. The affective learner learns best when presented with information that appeals to his or her feelings, beliefs, and values, while the psychomotor learner prefer to learn by doing it. Um, there is a way of determining a client's learning style, and it's easy to do that by um, asking them um, a question related to math. Let's say, when you learn to add fractions, what help you the most? Listening to the teacher's explanation um, by recognizing the value of fractions in cooking, uh, or working on some exercises, on some simple problems. The way that they will answer to you will be able for you to uh, put them in one of those uh, categories. We we'll also look at their age and developmental level. There are three major categories. Um, we are looking into pedagogy, which is the science of teaching children. That's one age group. Uh, or those that have cognitive abilities um, comparable to children. We have andragogy, or the science of teaching adult learners. And we have gerogogy, which is the science of teaching um, older adults.
terms of learning needs, learning needs are the skills and concepts that both the client and the family need to acquire in order to restore, maintain, or promote health. The easiest example that we can give you is the fact that um, it will be related to a client with diabetes that needs to learn how to self-administer insulin, which is a skill. To self-administer a medication is a skill. And we need to co connect that with a concept of how diabetes affects circulation. So identifying the important skill and concepts that the client must learn and then assessing what the client already knows will help in establishing the goals and will also allow us to design a teaching plan based on this individual uh, needs, as well as on how we evaluate the outcomes. The learning capacity represents the person's intellectual ability to understand, remember, and also apply new information. There are a few elements that will uh, require us to have special adaptation when implementing teaching, and those relate to illiteracy, sensory deficits, and the shortened attention span. Those patients that are not proficient in English may require translation of written information in order to understand and process the information and in order for them to uh, make appropriate health decisions. Motivation is also important in learning, is the, that desire to acquire new information. Whenever we have a person that sees a pers the purpose and has a reason uh, for learning, the learning will be at an accelerated rate. Uh, some motivating forces will be if we explain to them that by doing that, they will restore their independence, they will prevent complication, they will um, have a faster discharge, and they may return to or remain in the comfort of their home. Learning readiness. Well, learning readiness pertains to the optimal time for learning. It Ideally, it will happen when the client is in a state of physical and psychological well-being. For example, the client, first of all, is not in pain. It's comfortable. It's not too warm or too cold. It's not having any episode of anxiety. It's not depressed. All those will prevent them from achieving the best learning situation. Now we're looking into learning assessment and we will talk now about the informal teaching. Informal teaching, by its name, it should happen unplanned. It occurs spontaneously, is bedside, uh, while meeting the client at home, while on the other hand, the formal teaching will require a plan in order to um, avoid being haphazard. So when we are looking at the teacher plan, that will be an organized way of putting together the content that needs to be delivered in a specific time, time frame. By planning that, we facilitate reaching goals. Uh, we are sure that we provide the essential information and we also ensure that the client will have the compre comprehension before she or he will resume responsibility of self-care. The developing of a plan and implementing uh, will need to be gradually and sequentially in order to avoid overwhelming the client with new information or learning skills that are difficult to perform. In order to decide if the teaching was effective, we need to look into the learning comprehension. And this will allow us to understand the level of effectiveness. To determine if the information was understood correctly, uh, we can use one of or a combination of the following techniques. We can repeat back, we can teach back, or we can show back. And I will describe those. The repeat back means that my client will restate or paraphrase the points that I was presenting to them. The teach back is when the client will need to explain to me back the essential information that will show me that they have an understanding of the instructions. And the show back will be when the client is able to show me, to demonstrate the skill to myself or to another person. Um, and by doing that, they perform, they, um, they make me understand that they have a good grasp of what was presented to them. 
Which of the following will be the most favorable intervention for developing a teaching plan for adult clients? A. Use long, complex sentences. B. Implement the teaching plan gradually. C. Avoid relating new information to prior learning. Or D. Arrange content within a short period of time. Correct answer is B. Implement the teaching plan gradually. Developing a plan and implementing it gradually and sequentially avoids overwhelming the client with new information or new skills. 